Hey guys, Rick here. Hang on. Let me just verify that I am actually live. I just have to double check. Haha. Perfect. All right. Welcome, everybody. Glad to have everybody here. Let me get myself situated so that we are all set and ready to go. Um, welcome, welcome. So this is our uh, this is our first of three year-round gardening kind of uh, get you started workshops that um, I will be doing over the next couple of days. So let me turn myself back on and say hello to everybody. Um, welcome. We had about 150 people that pre-registered for this event. So we'll give it a minute here to see. We had about 30 or 40 people that were waiting when we were ready to start. So while we're here, tell us where you're from, what's your garden zone, what um, is, are your winters like? Uh, I'm interested to know because um, that's important for what we're going to be talking about today. So um, make sure that you uh, let me know. Okay, so we've got South Jordan, Utah. Hey, that's right close to me. Arizona, Nebraska, um, Turlock, California, Richmond, Utah, Connecticut, South Jersey, Texas, Oregon. Cool. All right. Welcome. Okay, so we're up to about 55 viewers. We're anticipating that we'll be about 100, 150 today. So um, let's kind of move along and talk. So just so you guys know, I hurt my back about a week ago and I have a hard time sitting. So, <laughs> so I'm going to move this along to make sure I get everything, all the information to you before I actually um, collapse in pain because I, I have a hard time sitting here right now. Um, I have to tell you about the cute little picture that I just saw too. I went upstairs to check. My wife AJ is upstairs monitoring the, the chat and she was sitting in the bed and we've got our little six month old grandson here with us today and he was asleep. So she had her headphones on trying to monitor the chat while, uh, while, uh, She's got the, the baby, so it was kind of cute. Um, okay, so welcome to day one. This is day one of this three-day three event that we do every year. So this is in celebration of our year-round gardening master course, which opened up yesterday. So our master course is kind of the, the, the great way for you to really get in and, and get dig in and learn a lot about year-round gardening and, and really get into the details. So we're going to give you a... a pretty good overview of the process and how we get started on growing year round over the next three days. So today we're going to talk about crops, um, the base crops that you can grow. Tomorrow we'll talk about timing and when you need to actually be planting. And then on Thursday we will talk about uh, protecting your crops and how you can, can get those crops to last all the way through the winter. Um, start times for all three events will be 1.30 p.m. We are going to do a prize drawing every day and um, you only have to enter once. So if you have already entered and pre-registered for today's event, you're registered for the prize drawings for all three days. Um, if you would like to uh, register for the prize drawing for the next two days, it's too late for today, but for the next two days, there's a link, first link in the description of this video will actually take you over so that you can get your name on the list for tomorrow's prize drawing, okay? All right, um, make sure you hang around to the end because I do have an opportunity for you guys to, to pick up a free course, kind of a bonus course that goes along with the Master Gardener or with the, uh, <laughs> the Year Round Gardening Master Course. So uh, make sure you stick around for that as well. All right, so today we are going to be talking about the seven base crops that you can grow in fall and winter. So we're gonna go through seven different crops that are really good for fall and winter gardening. We're gonna talk about the hardiness of each of those and then we are going to leave a little time for some questions towards the end as well. Um, today's class is designed for those of you that live in zones three through eight. Um, basically, anybody that has a cold winter is going to benefit from what we're teaching today. Um, it's also beneficial if you can start some seeds indoors, but it's not 100% necessary to do this. The reason why it's a little bit beneficial is a lot of us, you know, for example, me, my first frost day, October 1st. And, and so I'm actually going to be starting to plant my fall garden about August 1st. Well, August 1st, my summer garden is in full swing. You know, my tomatoes are just starting. My potatoes are, you know, 
loaded and just everything is is full and there's not a lot of space in my garden. And so it is handy as a year round gardener to be able to start some seeds indoors. Not ne not 100 percent necessary, but if if it helps with space, uh, because if I start those seedlings indoors on August 1st, then when they're ready to go out about September 15th, my garden's in a totally different scenario then. We, we've got a lot more space and there's plenty of room for those things to go out. So it helps if you can start some seed in, in, indoors, but it's not 100% necessary. And then um, everybody needs to be aware I'm going to talk about more about the Master Gardener. Uh, it's, sorry, I'm going to talk more about the year-round gardening master course. And uh, I have an offer for you. If that offends you, you're in the wrong place. Okay, so we are going to talk about that. All right, who am I? My name is Rick Stone. I am the founder of the Gardening Academy and the principal author on the website, Our Stony Acres. Um, also, you know, our YouTube channel, which is Stony Acres Gardening, is what you're watching this on right now. Um, I am a master gardener and we have been gardening for 23 plus years. And we've also been doing this year round gardening thing for this will be our 14th season. So this fall will be our 14th fall garden that, that we are going to be planting. So I've been doing this for a while now and love it. This is by far my favorite gardening topic to talk about. Uh, just really quick, I wanted to give you guys a, a couple of hints to, to follow. So as I'm teaching, I have a really hard time watching the feed. It's kind of over here on the side and I have a hard time watching the feed and, and looking for questions. And so is what I'm going to do is I, I have about 15 minutes worth of material to teach to you. And um, I, so I'm not going to answer questions during that time. My wife, AJ, is upstairs with another computer and she's going to be watching the feed. Do me a favor. If you have a question, put some question marks in front of it, because as you guys can see, we already have several hundred comments in the, the comment section and putting it, putting a few question marks before you ask the question will help AJ to identify those questions. The other thing that we did want to mention today is um, the last few workshops, we have kind of been a little loose on, on the questions, but everybody's here today to learn about year-round gardening. And so we're going to limit the questions to today's topic, which is year-round gardening and the base crops that we can grow. So so we're, I'm, I'm not going to answer the random, you know, what's this bug or, or things like that questions in this this particular one just because everybody signed up to be here to learn about year-round gardening. So we want to make sure we kind of stay on topic for that. Okay. All right. Let me turn your, myself off so that you can see this. Um, so this is one of my favorite things to do is go out in the middle of the winter and uh, harvest from our cold frame. That's a spinach bed in that picture. And um, let me tell you, let me start everything off today by kind of telling you a little bit of a story. So in 2008, or two, I guess it would probably be early 2009, we took our family to Southern California to the amusement parks down there. And while we were there, we noticed that in January, they were growing broccoli and kale and lettuce and Swiss chard in the flower beds of the amusement park. And we just thought that was so totally cool. And we talked about it several times on the drive home and, uh, you know, how cool that would be if we could do that here in Utah, which, you know, we got back to, U to Utah and it was, it was 20 degrees and we had six inches of snow. And, and so that's a little bit harder to do. So we, we talked a little bit more about it and we, you know, we, we kind of recognized that our family eats better in the summertime because we have fresh produce. Now that's not to say that we don't preserve. I mean, we can, we freeze, we do all that kind of stuff. But still, because there is so much fresh produce in the summer, we were eating better uh, and, and more healthy in the summertime. And we wanted to try and figure out how we could change that so that we were eating better all year long. And so I started doing some study, some research. I found two or three books uh, that I read that helped me learn that you can actually garden in the wintertime no matter where you live, really. And, uh, and, and so it gives everybody, all of us, an, an opportunity to, to garden in the winter, okay? So here's what's possible. Uh, that was 2009, and that, that spring, we planted our regular garden in May of 2009. And then that fall, we planted our first fall and winter garden. We have had something fresh in our garden every day since, okay? There has been something that we could harvest 365 days a year, every day for coming up on 14 years now, okay? 
So I, I, I say that kind of braggingly because it's cool and, I, and I, I love that fact, but that kind of tells you what is possible. Uh, you know, for 14 years now, we've been able to, any day that we wanted to, go out in our garden and harvest something fresh in a zone six garden, you know, with lots of snow and, and lots of cold weather, okay? So if you live in zones eight, nine, and 10, this should be pretty easy for you to do. Um, the, the, the level of protection that you need in those warmer zones is, is going to be less and you should, you know, pretty easily be able to do a 365 day a year um, garden. The hard part for you guys is probably now the summertime when it's so hot in, you know, like zone 10 and stuff. So that, um, <laughs> that's probably your hard time of the year. For those of us that live in zones five, six, and seven, and I'm in six, six B, uh, we will probably benefit the most from what I'm going to teach today um, because it, it's relatively easy for you guys to do this as well with just adding a little protection. For those of you that live in zones three and four, it is harder for you guys to pull this off, but not impossible. The number of crops is quite a bit fewer than, than for the rest of us just because it's, it's so cold in your area that a lot of things don't survive. But there are still a handful of crops that you can grow all winter long, even in zones three and four, okay? So there's three things that we're gonna talk about over the next couple of days to help you extend your, grow, your growing season. The first thing is you need to choose the right crops, okay? We're obviously in zone five, not going to be growing tomatoes outside in January, okay? It's not gonna happen. But we could be growing kale and spinach and carrots and all the things that we're going to talk about today. So you have to choose the right crops. Then we need to choose the right planting times, which is what we're going to talk about tomorrow. And then Thursday, um, we're going to talk about choosing uh, how to protect your crops and choosing devices and, and things in your garden that will help you to protect and extend that growing season. Okay. So today I'm going to talk briefly about... And by the way, guys, thank you. I did notice that we've got a few people that are putting questions in question marks. So if you've got a question for me as we're going through, put two or three question marks ahead of that. That will help uh, my wife, AJ, to identify those questions from everything that's going on. So thank you for, for doing that. And, and if as we go through these seven crops, if you have questions, make sure you put some question marks and then we'll get to answering the questions towards the end. All right, so there are some base crops that are really good for growing in the fall and the winter. So these are the ones, there's, there's actually about 30 total crops that you can grow in the fall and winter, okay? Some, some are only in the fall, like for example, cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower. Those are fall crops, okay? Um, there are others that can be both fall and winter crops. And so total there's about 30, but there these seven, that I have listed here, lettuce, spinach, Swiss chard, Asian greens, carrots, mosh, and kale are what I consider the base. These are the ones that you're gonna kind of build your winter garden and even your fall garden on, okay? Because these are going to be the hardiest and most productive crops for you that time of year. So as what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and talk individually about each of these crops just a little bit. We'll talk about their hardiness and, uh, and how effective they are uh, during the year. So first off, let's talk about lettuce. And I put lettuce first because it's actually the least hardy of all of the base crops. But it's very important to have lettuce as part of your fall crop and your, your early winter crop. Um, lettuce will stand up to frost, but it starts having problems when we start getting temperatures down in the low 20s Fahrenheit, okay? That's when we really start to see issues with lettuce. Um, is what will happen during that, you know, that early part of the winter is we'll, we'll you know, drop down in the 20s at night and then we'll jump back up into the mid 40s or 50s during the daytime. And so we freeze and then we thaw and then we freeze and then we thaw and we freeze and we thaw. That lettuce doesn't deal with that very well. So lettuce will actually kind of start falling apart once that, that cycle happens where we can't keep the temperatures in our cold frames and our hoop houses above 20, 25 degrees lettuce will start to kind of fall apart where a lot of the other crops won't. So lettuce, I kind of consider it to be a fall and very early winter crop. So that you guys know, this is what we use for our salad greens from about mid-October until sometimes as late as mid-December. Again, we're zone, zone 6B. 
Um, that two month time frame, we pretty much lettuce is what we are harvesting the most of because um, we need to get rid of it before the really cold weather settles in. So, so you've got that window. And then of course, again, as soon as the weather starts to warm up in the spring, so for us, late February, we start planting lettuce again in our cold frames because it will then take off and, and do well again. Lettuce is a great, great crop to have. It just is the least hardy of the ones we're going to talk about today. So plan on that being a fall and early, very early winter crop. Usually for most of us, um, by mid-December, it's going to be gone. Um, if you live in zone like 70 or 8, you'll, you'll probably be able to keep it going most of the winter, okay? Um, spinach. So spinach is the real workhorse of the um, greens part of our year-round garden. So you can see here, this is two of our cold frames. This is still in the fall because I can tell because my peppers are still there, but this is um, probably in early October for us. And back here in the back, we've got some, some lettuce growing and then this front bed is actually spinach, okay? Spinach, we, we just did last week, we did a whole workshop on growing spinach. So if you guys missed that workshop, it's on my channel. You can go and watch the replay on it. We spent about 20 minutes talking specifically about spinach. So I'm not really gonna spend a ton of time on it today, but I did wanna make sure that you guys recognize that how important spinach is for a winter garden. Uh, depending on where you live, you could get up to eight months from one planting. So we plant in August, early August, and we end up harvesting, we start harvesting about mid-October and we'll harvest from that same bed all the way through sometimes until May, depending on what our spring's like. If we have a warm spring, uh, we may not get quite as long of a harvest um, because the spinach will want to bolt and go to seed. Um, actually, believe it or not, the colder you are, the longer your harvest will be with spinach because if you have a cooler spring, then you're going to have less likely that it's going to bolt. For those of you in like 8, 9, and 10, you won't get nearly as long of a harvest as we do with spinach just because it's not cool enough for it there. But spinach is very, very hardy. This is one of those crops that even those of you that live in zones 3 and 4 can actually grow all through the winter, okay? Swiss chard is another one that is as hardy as spinach, okay? We do want to plant Swiss chard a little bit later because if you can see, let me turn this off again so that you can see. In this picture, this is what I want Swiss chard to look like over the winter. Um, I don't want it to turn into those big, beautiful plants that we see on Instagram with the long, thick, stocky. We, we want to actually keep it small. Those leaves are nice and tender and are really good for salads. They're also good for cooked greens as well. Um, so I usually will plant Swiss chard a little bit later, maybe a couple of weeks later than I do my spinach, just so that it stays small. We want to keep it small for the winter. And then once spring comes, you can take the, the tops off your cold frames or whatever and, and harvest those bigger leaves. But we want to have a nice, um, nice harvest of small leaves during the winter. And like I say, it's just as hardy as spinach. So those of you in zones three and four can plant Swiss chard and have it. It's great for salad greens when they're small, plus cooked greens as well. Um, so really, really good. Swiss chard is a great option for winter gardening. Um, and I found at first we didn't like Swiss chard, but that's because we let it get big. We let it get, you know, the, the great big leaves with the thick stalk and everything. And we didn't, we just didn't love it. We, it, we didn't hate it, but we didn't love it. I've really found that we really like the smaller young leaves of, of Swiss chard. So a really good crop for winter time. Okay. Uh, next is Asian greens. And let me turn this off. Uh, this picture that you see right here is actually tot soy. Um, tot soy is one of many Asian greens that will grow uh, in the fall and winter. Um, tot soy is actually the hardiest of all the Asian greens. So if you want uh, an Asian green that will make it all the way through the winter, tot soy is the variety that you want to choose. Um, tot soy, so that you know, it, it's kind of, it, it's, it's very similar texture to spinach and it's even its growth habit is, is very similar to spinach, but it has more of a cabbagey or almost a mustard like taste to it. Um, but very good and very, very hearty. Also bok choy and pak choy, which are basically the same plant also do really well in the fall. But again, like lettuce, I kind of consider those a fall crop. Um, they don't stand up quite as well to the cold weather 
as um, as some of the others. But bok choy, the, I, I I actually like bok choy in the fall better because it it's less likely to bolt. I don't know if you guys if it's the same for you guys, but every time I plant bok choy in the spring, before it ever even gets to a decent size, it starts to bolt and go to seed and put a flower head up. Because and the reason why is because um, that variety its trigger for, for going to seed is increasing daylight. And so in the spring, we have increasing day length and that causes it to go, go to seed. In the fall, we have decreasing day length. And so you are much less likely for pak choy and bok choy to actually go to seed in the fall, which is really, really good. I, I like that, but it's not quite as hardy. Tot soy is the one you want if you're gonna go all the way through the winter, but bok choy, is really good for a fall crop. And we'll usually have that all harvested by, you know, about the 1st of December as well. Um, next on the list is a root crop. And there are several root crops that do well during the winter time, but the star is carrots. So carrots are in the winter time. I've, I've almost given up on spring carrots. I, I mean, I plant them still. We have some now that we're, we're about ready to harvest, uh, but I like, fall carrots and winter carrots so much better um, because they're sweet. And, and it's, it's the first time you try a, a winter carrot, so a carrot that you harvest from your garden in January, you're, it'll be shocking to you. My, my family, uh, my, especially my little sister, just loves to come over and eat my carrots in the wintertime in January because they taste so different. They're sweet. The starches, the cold causes the starches to turn into sugars. And they are literally like, almost like eating candy. They are so sweet, um, just amazing. Um, in the fall, you do wanna look for smaller varieties. So um, the, the issue that we have again in the fall is we have decreasing day length. And so that means that everything takes longer to mature. So if you look for those smaller varieties that, that mature on shorter dates, um, that is going to be a better choice for fall and winter carrots because we need to get them mature by about mid-November in order for us to be able to harvest them during the winter time. And so choose, you know, the smaller varieties. I, the one that we love the best in this picture is of little fingers, they're called, and they, they get about four to sometimes six inches big. Um, Scarlet Nantes is another good one. Um, Napoli is another one. I haven't grown Napoli myself. I have grown Scar Scarlet Nantes and uh, both are really, really good for winter harvest. Now, I like to grow my carrots in a cold frame because it makes, them, makes it pretty easy to harvest them because the ground never really freezes inside the cold frame, at least not very hard, but you can actually grow carrots outside. So if you can get them to maturity by, like I say, about early to mid-November, then um, you can actually just like cover them with some straw maybe throw a fa heavy fabric row cover over the top of them, and then you can dig uh, carrots all winter long. The only problem with doing it that way is the ground freezes, and so it's more like prying them out of the ground instead of digging them out. out. When they're in a cold frame or a hoop house, it's usually a little bit easier to harvest. But carrots are amazing for, um, for wintertime harvest. Uh, just, we, we love them. We, we usually do at least one four by eight foot cold frame full of carrots. And we'll go out and harvest about once a week. We harvest enough for a whole week and uh, it's great. We love those carrots, okay? All right, I'm gonna turn me off again here so that you can see this. This is mosh. So sometimes also known as corn salad. Um, occasionally you'll hear it referred to as lamb's lettuce as well. Uh, <coughs> mosh is kind of the European name. Sorry, I'm gonna take a drink there. Mosh is kind of the European name for it. You can see it's kind of a lettucey crop. It uh, is a nice dark green. You harvest the entire plant, so it's not like lettuce in that way. You, you just kind of cut the entire plant off. Uh, but mosh is a really good crop to grow in the wintertime because it keeps growing. Most, most crops, even the ones that I've talked about so far, they stop growing after about... Um, the, about the first to the middle of November, depends on where you live. But once our, our day length reaches about 10 hours a day, those things kind of stop growing. But mosh continues to grow and put on growth. And it's really, really hardy, stands up to the cold temperatures. Like in zone seven, zone eight, you won't even need to offer it any protection. You can just plant it out in your garden and it'll grow all winter long. Um, 
very yummy kind of, again, it's a lettuce texture. You're going to make a salad out of it. It doesn't have a strong flavor like kale or Swiss chard or something. So you can actually make an entire salad out of mosh if you want. It has kind of a, a nutty flavor to it is the best way I can describe it. Um, it just has kind of a, a nice little nutty and again, tender leaves like a lettuce, um, but really good and, and then super, super, super hearty. The one thing that you do need to be aware of with mosh is it's a little bit harder to germinate. It likes about 65 degrees as its germination temperature. And so it, it struggles a little bit in some of the hotter areas. We have a hard time because our, our fall weather stays, you know, in the 80s and 90s until mid-October and then it just drops off dramatically. And so you, you might, that might be one that you might want to consider starting indoors where it's a little bit cooler or, um, you plant it a little bit later. So when we plant mosh outside in the garden, we usually wait until about September 1st, um, just so that it has a little cooler weather, okay? And then last on our list is kale. And this picture I think is, yeah, that's a red Russian kale. Um, kale is almost indestructible, okay, <laughs> when, when it comes to, to cold weather. Um, for us in zone 6B, Kale will make it unprotected through about half of our winters, um, depending on the year. Like last year, ours didn't make it, but we had temperatures down to zero degrees um, Fahrenheit last year. But some years when we don't have that really dramatic cold and we only get down to 10, um, kale will be fine in the garden, unprotected, okay? So those of you that live in zone seven and zone eight should be able to just plant kale and maybe at the very most throw a fabric grow cover over the top of it uh, when it gets really cold, when you have some really cold nights. But otherwise it's pretty indestructible. For us, it goes a little bit better if we try to plant it in a uh, hoop house. So kale gets too tall for a cold frame. So we'll put ours in a hoop house, cover it up with a hoop house and it, it will just go all winter long. And then the other thing about it is if you don't like kale, you need to try winter kale because it's a different beast again. The, the, the cold weather sweetens it up dramatically. It's the best kale that I've ever eaten. It, I, I, I don't like raw kale very much. I, I, I cook it, I'll, I'll use it as a cooked green a lot, but I don't really like raw kale, except in the winter. You know, in January and February and March, um, I, I will eat kale like I eat lettuce because it, it sweetens it up and it, and it just tastes so, so good. So. Best kale you're, you'll ever eat, will you'll harvest from your garden in February, okay? Um, all three types of kale do really well in the wintertime. So the, the red Russian kale does well, the Lassiano kale, which is the, the dinosaur kale, that does really well, and then the, the crinkly leaf like vates or winter boar, um, those do really well also. And in fact, our favorite for winter is that, that curly leaf. We use the variety called vates and uh, it, it is a really good variety to, um, to use. So there you go. That I think, yep, that's, that's it. That's our base crops. So those are the, the crops that you're gonna be planting the most of during the winter, okay? All right, so it looks like we do have a few questions. Let's just really quick, I want to talk about a couple of things. Um, so let me turn myself off here and uh, what's the best way for you to learn how to become a better year round gardener? It is joining me in the Year on Gardening Masterclass. Did you hear me put on my advertising voice? <laughs> so uh, we do have the uh, Year Round Gardening Master Course, which is live right now. We only open this master course up once a year. So in July is when we do it, and it, it is open just this week. Um, so the Year Round Gardening Master Course is uh, about five and a half hours of very in-depth instruction on how to grow a year-round garden, how to grow in the winter and the fall and the spring as well. We cover early spring gardening as well. So it's about five and a half hours worth. We do some weekly study guides. So as what we do is we, we try and get you ready for fall. Um, and over the next four weeks, starting on Monday the 17th, we're, we're going to study pretty intensely the different topics in the course. And we do a weekly study guide um, AJ actually has added this year, um, she spent time and has put together a workbook for us that goes along with everything. Um, and then uh, along with that, we also have Q&A sessions. So I, I actually get on live, not here on YouTube, but instead on Zoom so that you guys get a little bit more personal experience. Everybody that joins 
uh, gets to participate in those Q&As. We do those on Thursdays for the next four weeks. And uh, we'll probably do one or two sessions a day so that you guys all have an opportunity to get your questions answered. So we do those as well. Then we have a private Facebook group that you can be a part of also. And um, the course is open right now. So we opened it up yesterday. We've already had about 20 plus people join and uh, it will be open through uh, Saturday the 15th. Um, so you need to get signed up. Uh, and uh, it, it's it's a pretty, pretty fun course. It's actually my favorite time of year because I love teaching this topic so much. Um, normally, ongoing access to the course is $79. And uh, ongoing means that you'll have access to it for as long as I continue to teach the course. Um, you'll be able to watch it as many times as you want. Um, so the course is seven years old and we're actually redoing it this year. So we're in the process of refilming it right now. And, uh, and so you will get the updated version as those updates come out, you'll get the new stuff. We're not really adding a lot to it. It's just um, kind of an older course. And, and so we're, we're doing it with our newer cameras and stuff like that. But I do have a little special for you. Um, because you guys are here today and uh, a part of this um, workshop, I'm going to give you $10 off the price. So through the 15th, uh, there's a link in the description of this video that you can click on. And um, that will uh, give you a $10 off coupon. So if you just click on that, it'll take you over to the site and you can buy it with that $10 off coupon. So um, that is available through the 15th. And also as a bonus for you guys that came today, um, I've also got a free bonus course for you. This is my succession planting course, which goes along really well with year-round gardening and the entire concept of, of keeping a constant flow in your garden. And so this is a little mini course that I filmed that's about 25 minutes long on how to use succession planting in your garden as well. So that is um, also available for you to, um, to if, you, if you get signed up before Saturday. So you need, to, you need to sign up before Saturday and I will add that course to your profile as well. Okay. All right. So enough selling. Um, thank you guys for, for listening through that. And uh, I would really appreciate it. Uh, we love the year round gardening course. It was the second course I ever filmed. It's our biggest course. Um, more people in it than in any of our other courses. So I would love to have you come join us. And we're going to have a fun month um, over the next month as we, we go through and, and learn all these principles. Okay. All right. So let's do our prize winners for today. Um, so we have two prizes again this week. Uh, we have a smart pot. This week we have a three gallon smart pot and um, Angela D won that. And then we have another of the uh, Stony Acres seed collections and Cindy A won that. So congratulations to Angela and Cindy. And let me show you the seed collection. So this is the, the Stony Acres year round gardening seed collection. This is our fall and winter seed collection. And I is what I did is I partnered with True Leaf Marketplace and uh, we actually went through and chose my favorite seeds, my favorite varieties uh, for fall and winter. So all of the varieties that we talked about today, along with several others, there's 14 seeds total in here for only it's it's a little bit less than $17. Um, so you can there's a link in the description of this video you can click on if you want to check that out as well. But it's a really good value. I was really surprised when they came back with the price. 14 packages of seeds for only $17 is actually a really good price in today's market. So, um, yeah. So thank you, uh, for everybody for coming and being a part of this. And again, to our prize winners, which are Angela and Cindy, congratulations to both of you. Um, all right, so let's do some questions. So I guess I can make myself big again. Um, okay. So again, um, if you have, as we go through, we're going to try and limit this to about 45 or 50 minutes. So we've got about 10 or 15 minutes, and I already see that we have seven or eight um, different questions already that we can go through. So I'll, I'll get these answered. If you have questions that you would like to ask as we're going through over the next 10 minutes or so, put a couple of question marks in front of it so that AJ can uh, identify that you're actually asking a question. Um, so she's upstairs wrangling the six month old right now. Um, our little grandson's with us. And so uh, try and make it as easy on her as you can. And then again, remember, limit your questions to today's topic. OK. All right. So Angie is asking, um, my lowest temperature is 15 below. 
several freeze advisories around um, Indiana regarding my winter temperatures and what will have to be transferred indoors around January or do you leave them for spring harvest? Okay, so I don't, um, Angie, we don't transfer anything indoors. Uh, 15 below is cold, um, admittedly. And so that, that sounds like to me that you are probably like a zone four, uh, possibly zone three B, something like that. Um, so you are going to be limited on what you can grow, but you can still grow. So you're going to have to, obviously you're going to have to have a cold frame or um, a hoop house. Probably a cold frame would be the best choice. And then you're going to put a fabric row cover over the top of that also. So inside the cold frame, you'll put fabric row cover when it get, when it really starts to get cold. Um, but you should still be able to get spinach, Swiss chard, kale, mosh, hot soy and carrots to grow. Okay. So that those, those crops should all make it all the way through the winter. The biggest challenge for you is probably going to be finding a time to go harvest it because we do have to, we have to harvest those crops except for mosh. All of those crops actually need to be harvested when it's above freezing inside the cold frame. That doesn't matter about outside, but inside the cold frame. So You'll have to harvest on a nice sunny day when your cold frame isn't covered in snow. Um, but beyond that, you should be able to get those to survive. So um, the, those of us that live in warmer areas will have a much uh, bigger variety of crops that we can grow. But those six that I listed, you know, and, and they were most of them were the base crops we talked about today. You should still be able to harvest and won't need to bring them indoors. You won't need to worry about it. They'll, they'll survive. Um, they won't look very good, but they'll still taste good. Okay. All right. Um, have I tried, Donna's asking, have I tried celery? So celery is a pretty hardy plant. It actually does fairly well. Um, I've had two or three of my students over the years who have lived in slightly warmer areas. So again, like zone seven or zone eight, who have been able to overwinter celery in their garden. For those of us that live in the colder areas, the problem with celery is number one, it's taller. So you can't, you usually can't put it in a cold frame. It's going to be in a hoop house and hoop houses don't offer quite as much protection. And then um, it has more, how do I put this? It has more surface area that, that the stalk of a celery is more likely to get frozen and thawed and frozen and thawed and frozen and thawed. So it's a little bit tough to, to grow it all the way through the winter in some of the colder zone areas. But I, like I say, um, I've had a lot of, of my students who have done really well with it. I have, I have left um, celery in the garden as late as mm, one year we had it in probably until about November 1st. And uh, it had, we had thrown some fabric grow cover over it. Uh, and it, by, by November, we'd had quite a few pretty cold nights. And the outside of it, the out the outer part of the the stalks were mushy and and wilty but the inside was still crispy and we were able to use some but not all of it so um celery you know is is, a, is an okay option it's just not going to make it probably all the way through okay angie is asking i started swiss chard chard in april and nothing yet do i try to save swiss chard or toss it and um change it to kale so um, so your April planting of Swiss chard is probably not going to be ready for fall. It, you, you'll, I, I, and it kind of sounds like maybe you're having some problems with it. But um, if you want to do Swiss chard, you're going to plant it again. And tomorrow we'll talk about timing a little bit more. Um, so if you can't make it to tomorrow's workshop, it, it'll be on replay so that you can watch it. But but we can talk about, you know, Swiss chard, but, but Swiss chard and kale, either one of those. But um, Angie, you're probably still a few weeks away from needing to plant that. I mean, it sounded like to me that you were like maybe zone four or five, um, but we usually go about eight weeks before our first frost date, which is probably getting pretty close for you. But um, it, it, it's probably a little bit later before we're going to want to plant that. Okay. Um, Kylie is asking when you start lettuce in your cold frame, is it transplanted or direct sown? So um, depends on the year and what I have space wise. So Kylie, I, I will, you know, kind of bounce around from year to year, depending on what crops I have in the summertime. So some years I actually have space like this year. I'm not going to have space because I have potatoes planted in the area where my lettuce cold frame is going to be. And those potatoes probably won't be ready until 
about September 1st. So this year I'm going to transplant. So I'll start seedlings indoors and transplant those out into the garden in mid-September. But some years I start directly out in the garden with spinach and carrots. Those, those I have to make space for those to be planted directly in the garden. But a lot of the others you can transplant out. And I my kale, Swiss chard, mosh, all of those things, lettuce, I start indoors and then transplant out when I have more space, okay? Emily is asking, what variety of spinach do you have the best luck with in the fall? Great question. Um, the variety that's in this package, um, which is Bloomsdale Longstanding. Um, so that's my favorite variety. I've also grown a, another variety called um, Melody, and it did well, uh, but it's a hybrid. And so um, I, I kind of went away from it because I want to have the option of saving my own seeds. Not that I really ever do with spinach, but I, I always want to have that option available to me. So Bloomsdale Longstanding is the variety that I have used. And we have been growing that probably for, boy, the whole time we lived in this house. So 10 plus years, uh, we've been growing that variety and it does really well. That's my favorite one for that. Um, Cindy Lou is asking, she's in zone 5A. When I grew lettuce in the spring, it was very buggy, uh, light green bugs all over it. Is this common or is there something that you can do about it? So um, yes, that's common. It probably aphids um, based on the description, light green bugs. So it was probably aphids. Uh, the thing that you can do is uh, cover them with some fabric grow cover. So you want uh, you want to use like a light fabric grow cover if we're just going for bug protection. Um, from day one, cover those plants with a fabric grow cover. Or they're, they now they're starting to sell bug nettings. I haven't tried any of those yet. I just use fabric grow covers. But if you get the light fabric grow cover, so here we're talking about ones that have like a rating from somewhere between 0.7 to 0.9 ounces per square meter. Um, that is a light fabric grow cover. It, it'll say in the description, Let's 90 or 95% of all light and water through. That's what we're looking for, something light. Um, that will keep the bugs out, but still let the plants grow underneath. So that's a really good way to do that. Um, does the course, uh, Ivy is saying, does the course tell us exactly when and how to plant each plant for our specific planting zones? Yes, it does. But just so you know, planting zones are less important than frost dates. Okay, so, and, and all of us here, Sorry, all of us here on YouTube are guilty of relying too much on planting zones because it's an easy way to classify people. But actually, the more important thing for you to, to know is your first and last frost dates. So for a fall garden, it's your first frost date in the fall. We're going to base our planting times on those frost dates. And uh, the course actually goes through that. We're going to talk a little bit about it tomorrow, but, but we actually go through and talk about that uh, in detail um, in that, okay? All right, um, Holly is saying she's in zone 7B. Swiss chard, which I planted last October, is still growing strong. Should I pull it and replace it for this winter? Probably yes, um, Holly, because is what's going to happen between now and, um, and fall is that's going to go to seed. So Swiss chard is kind of like kale in, in that it's kind of biannual in its, in its habits. And so... It's growing right now, but but it's probably going to go to seed uh, before the fall, and so uh, I would re I would replace it. You know, I would just eat up what you have and and plant some new for the fall. And then the other thing is, um, the smaller plants are more hardy than the bigger plants. They're going to last longer. Okay, Nancy is saying, what is the variety of kale that I said I liked? It's Vates. It's called Vates kale. V a t e s Vates. It's a little bit harder to find. Um, we actually save our own seeds. And so I have like an 8,000 year supply of it and the seeds last for forever. So, um, but it's called Vates. Another one that is really good is called um, Winter Boar. And then there's another one called Siberian. Um, those are the curly leaf ones and we like those, but any you know, any kale that you like is gonna do really well. Red, red Russian kale does really well and the Lasiano kales all do really well uh, during the, the time. Um, okay. Uh, when does the class go live? It's actually live now. So, so you can buy it today. 
Um, so you can click on the link down below and you can buy it today. We will actually start the learning process next Monday, so the 17th. So we'll, we'll take this week as, as the sales event and then we start the actual course next week on the 17th. The first Q&A is on, sorry, I'm looking at my calendar here. The first Q&A is on Thursday the 20th. And so we will start that process um, on, on Monday is when it, when it starts. And so, but the other thing you need to be aware of, the course, once you buy it, you, you have access to the course. So we work our way through it at a, at a, at a two module a week pace so that you guys get a chance to really kind of absorb everything. But if you wanted to sit down and watch the entire course in an evening, you could, it's there for you to watch right now. Okay. Um, all right. Is it okay to place a hoop house over a series of pots or is it better to build over a raised bed frame. You're in zone 8B. So, <laughs> um, Laura, normally I would say, no, it's not a good idea. But you live in a zone that's warm enough that it's okay. Uh, so containers are up off the ground. They have smaller soil volumes than raised beds and in-ground gardens, obviously. Um, and so they, are, they will freeze quicker, okay? But in zone 8B, you are never going to see the cold temperatures that we see. You know, you'll, you'll get some freezing. I, I know that you get freezing and, and, and you'll get cold weather, but, um, but you're not going to see teens and, you know, 20s like, like we get and, and below. Uh, you're, you're just not going to see that very often. And so for you, it would be okay to build a hoop house over your, your containers if you wanted. Most people, I'm going to say absolutely not. It's not going to work they'll freeze too quickly and too hard. You know, if you live in zone seven, six, five, four, three, then it's not going to work. But in zone eight, yeah, you could, you could pull that off. Okay. All right, guys, let's, uh, we're at 45 minutes. So, um, just looking here. Okay. Um, so I think we're going to call it, I've got three more questions here. Um, ask, uh, Dr. Bonnie, Yours will be the last question, and then I think, um, <clears throat> then I think we'll we'll call it there. Well, okay, um, AJ, if you want to do Super Nerd's question as well, we can put that on there, and then we'll call it quits because my back hurts and my voice is running out, so I got to save it for the next two days. Okay, so Ellen is saying, do you show us how to build a cold frame in the course? Yes, I do. We actually have two lectures on how to build a cold frame, and. Um, as part of the refilm, I'm actually going to, uh, I, I need to redo some of my cold frame lids. They're, they're 12, 14, some of them are 13 years old, some of them are 14 years old. So I'm actually going to rebuild as part of the refilm that we're doing this, this winter. I'm going to rebuild some of those and we'll, we'll show that as well. So yes, but there's a ton of different ways to build cold frames, by the way. It does, you don't have to build the cold frame like I have. There's tons of different things that you can do. You can use old windows and all kinds of stuff. So we'll talk about all of that. Um, okay, Marlene is saying, what was the variety of mosh that you grow? There's a very limited number of varieties of mosh. The variety that I grow is called Dutch Broadleaf. Um, let me just, I'm, I'm going to open this up because I just want to make sure uh, that I, yeah. So it's, so, so it's called Dutch Broadleaf Corn Salad or mosh. Um, there's really only about um, two varieties that I've ever seen. Um, and I've grown both of them. This Dutch broadleaf is the one that is more readily available and uh, has done well for us. So, uh, but there, there's not a ton of mosh varieties out there. There's like one or two varieties is all you're ever going to see. Okay. Um, do I have the mosh seeds for sale? They're, I, I don't sell them myself, but True Leaf Market, they're part, the mosh seeds are part of this, this package if you want. Or if you don't need the whole package of 14 seeds, you can get them from True Leaf Market. So um, just just search for it. It's called on True Leaf Market. They call it corn salad. Okay, so it's it, it goes by either name, but True Leaf calls it corn salad on their their site. So, um, and then Super Nerd is asking, are you going to grow any perennial veg vegetables like sea kale or tree collards? Um, really good question, Super Nerd. Perennial vegetables is not something that I have done a lot of work with. Um, so I would like to. Um, and I would love your suggestions, uh, but um, 
but I, that's not something that I have, have done a lot of research in yet. So, um, yeah, maybe someday, but uh, I don't really, I don't really have a, a solid answer for you yet. So, um, okay. Uh, yeah, Lazy Bunny says, I thought you said frog leaf. It's Dutch broad, B-R-O-A-D, broad leaf. Dutch broad leaf is the mosh variety. And um, Ask Dr. Bonnie is saying, if you sign up for the course, will we get the older course until the new course is finished? Yes. So, um, so we're, we're going to... The course is five and a half hours long, and we're going to add that the content itself won't change very much. It's just that I filmed it seven years ago in this office, and I want to get out in the garden. I didn't have the ability to get away. I was tied to a wired mic and all that kind of stuff. Now we have fancy microphones and cameras, and we can get out in the garden and do a lot more, and I, I'm better at what I do. And so we felt like it was time to actually renew this course. And so but it's going to be a process because it, I don't have time to sit down because because filming five and a half hours worth of content is actually like a three or four week process. Uh, and so we're going to slowly go through and and it, the fun thing will be is that I'll, you know, when we talk about harvesting, I'm going to go out in the garden in the snow and harvest. So I won't I won't do the harvest refilm until, you know, January, probably. So it'll kind of be a slow process and we're, we're going to just go through and update. It, the content itself really won't change very much. The course is really, really good. It's my most popular course. We just felt like it was time to bring it into the, you know, the, the newer equipment and everything that we have. So we'll be slowly filming that and you will get people that buy it this year. will get the old version now so that you can get your garden planted and then you'll get the updated version as, as we go through the season, you'll, you'll, you'll get the benefit of, of getting both. So um, when we replace the lecture, we'll just, the old one will go away, the new one will appear. So um, that will be a fun thing to do. And uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, it'll be a lot of work, but um, we just refilmed my seed starting course too. And uh, that one will go live here in a little bit, but we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and, and redo that. So it should be good. Okay, so make sure that you guys take advantage of that offer. Um, uh, that, that special offer ends on July 15th uh, is when we are closing the course uh, for the year. And so make sure you take advantage of that. It was $69 is the price. And then don't forget that we are doing another workshop today or tomorrow. So uh, that workshop will be tomorrow, July 12th at 1.30 p.m. Mountain Time. And uh, that one will be talking about the timing of when you should be planting some of those base crops. Okay. All right, my friends, I think we are going to call it quits for the day. We're at 52 minutes, and my back is saying it's time to stand up. So I think we will take off. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, um, and for those of you that maybe showed up a little bit late, uh, this replay will be up for, for a, about a month or so. We'll, we'll leave this replay up. And uh, and then again, you know, go buy the new the, the master course. It's uh, down in the description below. You only have until Friday uh, to take advantage, I'm sorry, Saturday to take advantage of that uh, 50 or $69 op option. So you get $10 off. So uh, click on the link down below. Okay. Thank you guys. Appreciate everybody staying and listening and we will talk to you tomorrow. Happy gardening.